The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Peter 4, 14. Page 24 of your notes. All right. It is our custom at Maranatha Church to give you the necessary few moments to be sure that you are spiritually ready for the intake of Bible doctrine. Now, this diagram illustrates two of the three adjustments to God. The first adjustment is the salvation adjustment. It is a one-step process. Anyone who will acknowledge or believe in Jesus Christ for salvation is instantly incorporated into the family of God forever. This circle, <clears throat> this circle represents union with Christ. Any expressions in your Bible, in Christ, in him, etc. When, when a person is saved, they are given a dry baptism. They are entered into union with Christ. And it is a one-step process, never needs to be repeated, and it gets the individual out of the gravest danger that is against humanity. And that is living out your life under spiritual death and winding up in the lake of fire. To avoid that, all you gotta do is believe in Christ and you sidestep eternal torment. That's the first adjustment. You can't mess it up. No one else can mess it up. Nothing can separate you from God. Death, any danger, anything. The second adjustment is after you become a believer or a child of God, <coughs> you're going to continue to have a sin nature. That's right. The Adamic nature didn't go away when you got saved. It didn't even get toned down. <laughs> we have the scripture to back it up. So that after salvation, when you sin, what are you required to do? Confess it to God. It only takes a moment. It can be a mental attitude sin. Anger. It can be a verbal sin. Gossip. It can be an overt sin. Name one. Getting drunk. Anything like this knocks you out of fellowship. Based on 1 John 1, 9, this is the formula for the restoration of fellowship. When I'm out of fellowship, I'm being ruled by my sin nature. When I, we call it, rebound, I'm back in fellowship and I'm filled with the spirit. It's like turning, it's like going into a room and flipping a switch and the lights are on, flip them off and they're off. So throughout the course of your life and every day, you are going to sin. It, of course, it isn't God's will, there are sins of ignorance. Well, I didn't know that was a sin. People complain, right? That's a verbal sin or a mental attitude that sponsors a verbal sin. When you confess your sin, let's say you got out of fellowship at some point in the day and then you got around to, oh, I need to rebound. I can't remember everything. You don't have to. It says, if we confess, the word confess means to name, cite, or acknowledge something. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This, isn't, this verse isn't for the unbeliever. The unbeliever is required to confess his or her sins. They're required to believe in Christ, and all the sins before that are forgiven. And so after salvation... This is what we do. We have all these analogies in scripture. We have a whole doctrine on rebound. It's analogous to 
You don't just wash your hands once in your life. And so when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he was teaching rebound. Now, when you are in fellowship, you fulfill the command to be filled with the Spirit. When you're out of fellowship, you grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. This, no other thing is required but name it and move on. Name it and move on. And you're naming it not to me, but to God. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. That's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess a third class condition in the Greek, which says maybe you will and maybe you won't. But if you do, you restore fellowship with God, moment by moment. The Christian life is a moment by moment walk. And if you weren't taught this in a church, then that's a complete breakdown. They might have said, oh, you, you're supposed to confess your sins, but no, I'm saying you're supposed to do it ideally quickly. So if you sit here out of fellowship, what you do is you frustrate the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is given to us, among other things, to lead us into the truth, to make clear to us spiritual principles. The only handicap you might have is a lack of frame of reference. You didn't get a good spiritual foundation. You didn't get the ABCs of Christianity taught to you clearly. Well, we'll fix that. It takes time. But, it, but you can continue what I've just presented. You can comprehend that at a, at a certain level. Now, the third adjustment, we all start off, like in life, babies, baby believers. I don't care if you were saved when you were 40. You're a baby believer. Can't get around that. As you assimilate spiritual food and apply it, you grow incrementally up this ladder. Eventually, it isn't a, it isn't a, it's no quick shot to a mature believer. In between the two is you're an adolescent. We established this in 1 John and elsewhere. Three levels of growth. You may not know when you're a spiritual adolescent. It has nothing to do with your chronological age. It has everything to do with being exposed to sound doctrine. Do you in life want, uh, if you're looking for information on a topic, do you, do you want stuff that's incomplete, erroneous, mixed in with what's good? No. You try to fix a recipe, it won't turn out. So you need sound doctrine to make the maturity adjustment. And the environment for the intake of doctrine is the local church, the classroom of Christianity. You're the student, I'm the professor, this is the textbook, so this is your opportunity if you're out of fellowship, or if you get out of fellowship at any point, you can say, Father, I confess that, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we assemble ourselves under the royal command the royal imperative to grow in grace and knowledge. And we thank you that you have provided for us this environment so that we can consider the topic at hand. Bless our time together in Christ's name, amen. All right, we're dealing with a sub subject that's all around in the world, suffering. <laughs> a lot of people are suffering on this earth today. All kinds of suffering is going on from a lot of reasons. But we're dealing with the subject of Christian suffering in particular. And here's how we break down suffering for the believer. Two kinds. Deserved. That's called divine discipline. God disciplines his children for sins according to his sovereign will in each matter. That's why when you sin, you ought to confess it real quick. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. I'm not trying to encourage anybody to sin. I don't need to encourage anybody to sin. <laughs> I'm just facing the stark reality that after salvation, you and I continue to sin. 
in our daily, everyday deal. There's a whole, there's a whole area of lust. It didn't go away when you got saved. So there's a, but we're not, we'll get to that. Uh, deserve suffering. Divine discipline. The Bible says uh, that God disciplines. It, it says, do not despise the chastisement or the discipline of the Lord when you get it. Now, there is undeserved suffering. There's undeserved suffering from the source of people, others. <coughs> and so as a believer, you, and as a positive believer, a growing positive believer, you are subject to undeserved suffering from the source of others. Attacks of various kinds, verbal. <clears throat> and these Christians have been informed here in this letter because they came out of a background in which everybody followed all these multi-gods and deities. They broke with that when they accepted Jesus Christ. The deities and all this superstition and all that, it's all fake. They came to faith in Jesus Christ and they took heat for it from, from family and friends and associates. The cosmos does not much like the believer who is a light in the midst of the darkness. They don't. Look how they treated Jesus at the first advent. And of all people who should have known better was the chosen people, the Jewish race. So he suffered at the hands of people. And I'm not just talking about at the end and the cross and all that, that too. But through his public ministry in particular, he suffered. So in verse 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ. Now let me explain here. If you are reviled, this is a first class condition and you will be. If you live the Christian life, sooner or later, you're going to be the object of verbal attack. Whatever, whatever form it takes. If, the particle, I, if you are reviled, onai, onai di, dizo. This word is here, it means to denounce, revile, reproach. Found some nine times in the New Testament, this Greek noun. That's why I'm so happy to have a, a program called Bible Works. I can plug in any word, any construction, and I can find out that quick how many times it occurs. I didn't get to do that in the old days. It was tedious, I had to open books. So I have this thing called Bible Works. Uh, it's, it's at the very top of the list of my most valued possessions. And we copied it and put it in other places because they don't make it anymore, I understand. So I can, whether it's an English word, a Hebrew word, or a Greek word, or a whole phrase, it'll tell me every time it occurs. It'll break down every verse in the original languages. And this is where I would, would, would get all these citations. For if you are reviled for the name of Christ, name, onoma, of Christ. Now what this means is, it's not just the name Jesus Christ, it's what he stands for. The name of somebody carries with it a reputation, a history. So the name of Christ is more than just Jesus Christ as a person. It's all that is related to that he's all about. You know this Bible? The Bible says we have Paul said, we have the mind of Christ, the thinking of Christ. It's embedded in the text of scripture, but just possessing a Bible, you need to possess the correct interpretation. And by the way, if you don't have a New American Standard, 1997 edition, 
We'll give you one here, or you can go to the bookstore and get one. Don't, we do not mess with the King James Version. It's archaic. We don't talk like that. That's Elizabethan, old time English. Okay, that Bible served people, but we need the best English translation we can lay our hands on. It's the New American Standard. And the most recent edition of it, the one I'm, we use here, is the, uh, I believe it's 1997 edition. It took out all the these and the vows. When you talk to God, you don't have to go thee. There's not a separate pronoun for, for pronouns for deity as versus humanity. It's you, etc. You know, it might sound like holy language, but it isn't. It is not. It's just, it's just what people, you know, fell for. I just thought I'd throw that in. New American Standard. The only way to go. You can get it in various forms. Big print, indexed, all the rest. That's your business. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, he knows they are, you are blessed. You are blessed. Blessed are you, literally, in the Greek. Uh, blessed. <clears throat> you are, uh, uh, this is makairos. You are blessed. This form occurs 26 times. Because, explanation. Because, and what's the nature of it? Because the Spirit, third person of the Godhead, the Spirit of glory, referring to heaven above, the Spirit of glory. Glory is used in a variety of ways. Here it is used for heaven proper. Because the Spirit of glory and of God rests the word rest is a present middle indicative on a pio, or pao, excuse me, I mispronounced it, on a pao. Uh, it means to rest, rest upon you. Well, let's see if we can break this down. So this is the thought. If you're the subject, whether it's direct or indirect, a verbal attack, this is dealing with verbal attacks, people saying, nasty things, ridiculing, all of it, if you should come under it from family or anyone else, you're blessed. People say, you, you probably didn't think of that, did you? You probably didn't think that when someone's on your case about your beliefs and your church and whatever, you're blessed. They're the ones out of line. And their words don't mean anything in the long run. And we also saw earlier on that those who continue that and don't back off, they're going to give an account. Everybody's going to give an account, believers and unbelievers, at the various judgments, the final judgments. We all at the rapture, when we're raptured up out of here. And it looks like that's pretty soon, real soon the way things are heading on the face of this earth. It's unbelievable where we're at right now. Just look at the news, look around you. There are natural catastrophes, not, in the, not the ordinary stuff. Those poor people in Houston got slapped, but it's all everywhere else too. All, I read around all these countries where all this is going on. Famines, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, and all the associated stuff. It's ramped up. Even they're recognized this is unprecedented because we're getting ever so close to the day of the Lord the tribulation. And most of these people, it's their doing, most of these people are oblivious. They want to make America a better place. Well, is it going to happen? That's already said. 
I think it's going to turn. No, it isn't going to turn around. Get the doctrine of the United States and prophecy and look at the documentation. This country. I'm tempted to go that direction, but I'm not. I'm, I'm going to d discipline myself for a minute. If someone came up to me and I didn't know, and I said, "Hey, hey, Jack, do you, do you know that the U.S. is in prophecy?" I'd say, "What? What's your what's your documentation?" And they lay a doctrine in front of me. It behooves me to go sit down and look 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 at it with a fine tooth comb. And that's what I did back in 1976 when someone dropped a booklet in front of me entitled, Is the United States in Prophecy? It sat on my desk for some time. I thought, ah. But I realized, you know, I prayed for understanding and wisdom. And, I, and if someone wants to hand deliver something to me, and it's been, it's been done in a couple cases. One of them was the recalculated date of the birth of Christ. And it isn't December the 25th or fourth, <laughs> the whole Christian world's following. It was September the 11th, 3 BC, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. He was born on the Jewish New Year, just like if you were born on January the 1st, you'd say I was born on, the, on, our, on our calendar on the 1st. Somebody told me, a professor out oh you. I guess he, I don't know if he was trying to twit the students because a lot of them come out of churches and stuff. He said there, <laughs> he says there's no way the Romans would have had a census in the winter because everyone had to travel to, and go to their hometown and sign something periodically. Highly, you know, they didn't have any kind of communication, could do it another way. You had to go to your hometown. That's why Mary and Joseph went down to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And that fulfilled a prophecy in the Old Testament that specified that the Messiah would be born in the little hamlet of Bethlehem, 10 miles outside the big bad city of Jerusalem. Well, I got that. A pastor mailed it to me at Christmas time in a brown wrapper. It wasn't labeled as a Christmas gift. It was out of his library. And it was written by a fellow from Oklahoma. I forgot it. I think his name's Martin, last name. It's in our library. Anyway, these are some of the breakthroughs we've had over the years. Well, why do they do it when they do it? Tr the traditions of men. The traditions of men. Some, somebody made it up. Oh, I know why they made it up. For convenience. The pagans loved the 25th or 24th of December because they had a holiday they celebrated called Saturnalia. They're about to go into the dark, deep, like say if you're in Italy, you're about to go into the dark, deep winter months. So they're going to have a final blast. They're going to decorate their trees with finery. They're going to feast and give each other gifts. Sound familiar? We'll just make that the birth of Christ. Boom. So the pagans were appeased who came out of paganism into Christianity. We just want our Saturnalia. Okay. See, this is accommodating people when you shouldn't. And these how these traditions get rolling and these th things get misplaced. All kinds of stuff's been misplaced. They got it wrong. They don't know where the Jews crossed the Red Sea. We do, because somebody went in there and did some scuba diving. In the Gulf of Aqaba. Here's Egypt, here's the so-called Sinai Peninsula, and the Sinai Mountain that's on the Sinai site, it's a fake site. That's not the mountain they gathered around. It's not the mountain of the law. It's in Saudi Arabia, across the Gulf of Aqaba. And there's a land bridge underneath, a natural one, they walked on, because that water is really deep. At the, at the midpoint of Aqaba, the water is almost as high as the Empire State. And there's a verse in Isaiah, I, I took you through deep waters. So when you're walking through it, 
On each side is this wall of water that God's holding up. It says he piled up the water. You don't pile up water, but God can. You can pile up sand. These are some of, the, some of the breakthroughs we've had in our history. Another one that I like to celebrate, and this one, I didn't get a book. I didn't get, I, 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 no, one, no one primed the pump. I just kept looking at some verses. And I figured out from Revelation chapter 17 in a discussion of the Antichrist, I figured out who he was. He is the most famous person from the ancient world, the most famous conqueror. It's all over the web lately. The search for Alexander the Great. They're looking for his remains. They got his fathers. They got other of his relatives. They're looking for his remains. We think we know where they're at. This will sound funny, but I can't go into it. There is the view that he's in this box. He was mummified, Egyptian style, his body. He died at 30, age 32 after he conquered the world. He started, he started conquering at age 20. And he died in Babylon. They think it's in a church, Catholic. In Vienna, if I'm right, St. Mark's Church. You can go check it out. Kind of interesting. But they're going to find his remains because God's going to bring him back. It says in Revelation 17, he comes up out of the abyss. And last time I checked, the abyss is a synonym for hell. And he's going to be given a mind and a body to function in a modern world on a level like you can't believe. He won't have to learn any technology. It'll all be downloaded into his brain. And he isn't going to be an AI. He's going to be a living, breathing human being. And it's going to be spectacular when he comes back. And he's going to head up Western Europe, the revived Roman Empire. So if you look at Revelation 17 in the day of John, he saw the vision, a beast, a red colored beast with a uh, woman astride it, all decked out with seven heads. And he says, five have fallen. That starts with Egypt, okay? Assyria, Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, and number five is Greece. One is Roman Empire, and one is yet to come. Revived Roman Empire. And then there's more about the seventh head that pops up with ten horns on it. Alexander is going to come on the scene. He, they will be able with his DNA to prove who he is. Because they got his father's bones. Isn't it nice we got that technology now? DNA identification? It's useful. Very useful in solving crimes and other things. They'll be able to make the match. And if I'm right, if they're right about this being, his, his remains being in this box, there's a whole story about how, how we'd wind up there. They think it's St. Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And it's the Antichrist, and he pops out of there in a Catholic church. And he will be here for the period of the tribulation. And at the end of it, Jesus Christ will personally take him down at Armageddon and all those other armies. He's going to make a deal with the negative Jews. And they're going to put his AI in the temple. It's in Revelation 13. Look at this. All the technology that you couldn't have had this before 
our, 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 our specific time. Yeah, we're, we're in the last of the last days. And most people out there are as blind as they can be. I was going to say as blind as a bat, but a bat can navigate. <laughs> they really are stumbling around in darkness. Conservatives, liberals, religious types. It's sort of like if you don't have your repertoire intact, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't execute this. If you just want to go to church and feel good, rah, 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 sing some hymns, that doesn't advance you spiritually. It fulfills God's will for you, but it doesn't, this isn't what advances you. Alex is coming back. And he is going to defeat, he's going to defeat nations around there, right and left, like he did of old. And his followers will say, who can make war with the beast? And they'll call him the beast. Well, there's somebody that can make war with him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he and the false prophet will be taken captive by Christ at the second advent. And they'll be jettisoned into the lake of fire. Two other fellows are coming back too from the past. Two good guys. The two guys that met with Jesus and his three disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Tabor. The one my wife and I drove up to, drove up to the top in our rental car in 1999. Moses and Elijah. The miracle working prophets of the Old Testament. They're coming back. And God's going to set them down right out there where John the Baptist ministered. He didn't do miracles, but they will. What kind of miracles? Not to heal people. They'll bring environmental judgments all around the world. You know, you know the Moses thing, water to blood? Elijah, fire out of heaven. You see a bunch of that in the, in the book of Revelation. They're coming back. And oh, will they be hated? What is their mission? To call the Jews back to God. To introduce them afresh to who and what the, the Messiah, their ancestors rejected. And a bunch of will be takers. So these are the things that are on the horizon. And if you have any questions, all of our doctrines and everything is available, unlike a lot of people, free of charge. We don't believe in charging for spiritual information. Nobody else should either. You know, buy this booklet for, they do it all, they do it all over. We do not merchandise the word of God. If you want to support this church of your own free will, that's your business. We've made it this far. God's taken care of us for 50, almost 51 years since I came up here. I was a little bit younger then. It's supposed to be funny. I was 26 when I, when, I, when, I, when I started with this group and we weren't on this property. We were cash and carry for five years. Rent this, these, boom, boom, boom. and then we found this place that was a dump, more or less. But it had all the ingredients to fix it up. And our, and our people, with their, with their efforts, their expertise, with their money, with everything, this property and my house right here and all of it was put up during these years. Right now we're needing to replace the roofs on these two places. They've suffered a certain amount of hail damage. Pray about it, we'll get it done right. By the right person, the right way, that's all I'm saying for your information. Okay, let's go back to what we're after here. Point one, verse 14 begins with a first class condition which presumes reality. Two, Christians inevitably face verbal abuse, if nothing more. Three, reviled refers to strictly to verbal attacks. 
That is and was the most common form of persecution of Christians because it's easy to do, to run your mouth. Oh, you're following a crucified Jew. Yes, but he was also resurrected. <laughs> so there's a little more to the story. They couldn't keep him in the ground. And all the evidence was there for the people at that time to do a, an investigation to see if there was no foul play. And all the evidence was there. The stone, that's why he was put in a rich man's tomb. And not just thrown out here with a bunch of other people in a mass grave. You couldn't prove anything with that. So he was laid in this rich man's tomb that was cut out of solid rock with this big, big opening and this huge rock that fit like a glove right in there. And the next morning, that rock, that rock was rolled up an incline. No thieves would have rolled it up a hill. And his grave clothes, if you could come out of your clothing, say you're laying flat on your back, and you could come out of your clothing, and not one button is undone, everything is intact, your shoes are tied, blah, blah, blah. That's how he came up out of that. They weren't all scattered all over in there or in a neat little pile over in the corner or missing. It was laying right there and the head wrapping was separate from the body. And when, the, and when John and Peter, who, they had a foot race getting there, they got there, it said John looked and it says he believed. So he told his disciples on the third day, I'm gonna be raised. What did you understand about that? And they're up there in the upper room. Oh. <sighs> that was his body. And that, oh, the Jews went to Pilate and said, that deceiver, referring to Jesus, verbal attack, that deceiver said he's going to raise on the third day. So can we have a contingent of Romans out there, soldiers, and guard and stand guard over that just until the morning? Okay. I'm, I'm thinking of how the pilot dealing with the Jews. <laughs> All right. So there was a centurion and his soldiers. I don't know how, what the exact number was. They're guarding the place. And they're going to guard it with their lives. They're trained Roman soldiers. So they're going to know no funny business. But when, this, when the resurrection occurred and an angel showed up that was shooting light out from him, I, no one can depict this properly. These guys actually, through fear, passed out. Now these are not the kind of guys who would easily get frightened and fall over. But passing out is one of the ways people deal with extreme fearful moments. They just shut down. They all shut down. Now that doesn't look good. So they got to go. They failed in their mission, right? So to speak. So they, they ran to the Jews and said, would you give a good word to Pilate, blah, blah, blah. He said, we'll take care of it for you. Because they were, they were worried that they were going to come under some serious stuff. So see, the, all this evidence was there. And then, of course, the post-resurrection appearances. God always provides evidence for stuff. If you're an objective observer. That's how you solve crimes and stuff. That's how you figure stuff out. So all the evidence was there. For anybody to come in and do any kind of an investigation that the only answer to the missing person, Jesus, is he was resurrected. Here's his grave clothes. You've seen all these crime shows. Oh, this was there here, and this was here. They go through all this. It couldn't be this way because this was, there. okay. Okay, we get it. People do investigations because they want to get the right answer, hopefully. So they were, so those Christians came under attack. You, you, you've got to appreciate the fact. When you step out of your corrupt culture, when you, when you, turn away from your previous false religions, beliefs, and practices, and you're not going to run with them anymore. I don't care what your mother says. 
You can still respect her, but you don't have to, you don't have to believe what she believes. If she's messed up, she's messed up. It's another person that you have a responsibility at a certain level, but not to go along with it. They'll try all kinds of things. They'll start crying or threatening. We disinherit you. Okay. That's how you feel about it. But I'm following the truth that has been revealed to me, and I've stepped out of the darkness. So whenever you get a true doctrine, in, doctrine is, was, what is Bible doctrine compared to? Light, L-I-G-H-T. And if you have darkness in your soul, I'm here to try to help you to eliminate that and place in it the mind of Christ or the thinking of Christ on whatever the topic is. Our topic now is suffering, verbal suffering, at the hands of people who like to badmouth us. I know, I have been the object of it to my face and through others who have told me. But mine wasn't from a bunch of unbelievers. It was ex-church members that went sour. You know what they like to do? They like to bring up some sin from your past. Now, how Christian is that? We don't all go running around here and say, you remember what you did back in 1994? That's crazy. We don't discuss that. That's all behind us. We've rebounded and moved on. You want to dredge that up to try to say that therefore proves they're not any good now? Have you studied the Bible at all? Have you studied the character and the history of Samson? What was his last episode? He's intimately involved with Delilah. One day, go read the life of, just for kicks, go read, go read uh, the life of Samson. And I'll give you the punchline. How do I know that he ended up on a positive note as a believer? We know he's a believer. Because in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, where the key, one of the buzzwords throughout that is, found approval. So-and-so found approval. And so, he, he just couldn't get the thing with women straight. He married the wrong one, a non-Jewish woman. His mother said to him, why can't you marry a nice Jewish girl? <laughs> Sound familiar? Sound something? Well, she got killed. The next female, and I'm not saying there was one, there was all, all kinds of them. I'm just saying, I'll just stick with the record. He was in a Philistine town. He came out. He, well, he came, he picked up a prostitute. It wasn't for fellowship. And about midnight, it says he comes walking out and tears off the city gates and drags them 40 miles. They didn't make flimsy gates. They're not like these, these are nice gates out here, but they, 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 these are big, heavy, heavy iron gates. And then his last episode with Delilah, he, he divulged, it, it wasn't the sex. It was he divulged the secret of his strength. That was apparently a big no-no. And he didn't have that strength. He was just a, he was a real strong man, but not that supernatural stuff. And they took him in, in, in the custody and they poked his eyes out. And they hooked him up to a big thing that ground wheat, uh, millstone, and made him like an, like, a, like an ox pulling this thing around. Then they got all the Philistines from the cities, all, all of them, because he'd been public enemy number one. He killed more Philistines. <laughs> Because that was his mission. They're the modern Gazans, I guess. And so they have him out there and they're going to make a spectacle of him and celebrate and have a big party. All the VIPs, everybody, all the top brass, all of them. Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. We got him now. Huh? I knew he'd win.
and he was between two pillars. He had to ask a little boy. Whereas he knew that he knew the layout of the place. He knew the supporting pillars where they were. He said, "Would you get me over there?" Oh yeah, this is it. And he offered up a prayer. Well, he had to rebound, right? Confess his sins. You don't have to go through some big rigmarole like Catholics drag people through and other religions. Oh, you got to go here and sit in a box and tell all this and count your beat. Oh, whatever. And he prayed to God one more time. I know what you put me on this earth to do. To stack up Philistines like cordwood. And we know the rest of the story. He pushed those two pillars apart and this whole house came down on everybody, killing him and everybody else. And he killed more in his death than he did in his entire life. And he, and he finished his course. Have you heard of that in the Bible? Finishing your course? It's a race and it's got rules. They're not onerous. Yes, you have to make sacrifices. You have to make sacrifices. You have to put doctrine first and everything else after that. Doesn't mean you have to neglect your health, neglect your family, neglect working for an honest living, no. But you build everything around the intake of Bible doctrine. And here at Maranatha, it is not that difficult physically. We meet, we have four Bible classes and three trips from where you live to here. That's how hard it is. And if you want to, uh, when I first got on Sound Doctrine as a Baptist minister, young preacher boy, back in Arkansas, when I got on Doctrine, I couldn't get enough of it. Because I know that, that, that the road I was on was just, I was running around in circles. Why aren't they teaching the Bible? Oh, they have a Bible school over here. They have a Bible class in church where you can go to. Oh, yeah, right. That's real academic. These people aren't qualified. I'm not talking about teaching children. I'm talking about adults. They don't know original languages. They haven't been taught systematic theology. This isn't even in their vocabulary. They'll just get stories out of the Bible and that's it. And it doesn't become real to us. It's just pablum. When you want to get in, when, you, when you're in any subject you, that you, you're serious about, you want to get into the depths of it. That's what I'm saying here. Okay, reviled refers to verbal attacks. Four, this is and was the most common form of persecution. Five, the phrase, the name of Christ, indicates a specific context and not verbal abuse in general. When we are spoken of, because of our stand on spiritual matters, we are blessed. I can tell you a lot of different ways I've been blessed. A lot of different things. It's a long list. But maybe you never thought in terms of someone verbally saying something, you are blessed. Oh, it isn't pleasant. It doesn't say it has to be pleasant. It's just in the back of your ground, mind, you know that you're blessed. And that God's going to reward you for bearing up under that. Any sufferings you and I have as believers, when we apply doctrine, we're going to get a reward at the end of it. So if you're the object of that, then you're going to, it's, it's going to be made good for you. The adjective blessed or blessed occurs in this form 26 times in the New Testament. The word indicates happy, fortunate, blessed. It is featured in the nine Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. Some are unexpected. Blessed are you when people do the following. All right, let's take our break. Uh, we have coffee and goodies back there if you're interested. And uh, we'll be back here around 11. <laughs> 